thank you for coming. And uh, I am very glad to be in Austin. And really, is there a better place to have a discussion about food transparency? Uh, my husband and I were lucky enough to spend a month here last winter. And to our chagrin, we did not do it this winter because we're on Cape Cod. And this would have been a whole lot more fun. But one of the things that we noticed is that in Austin, People seem to care about where their food comes from. And not it's the birthplace of Whole Foods. We've got Central Market. But there are also all of these restaurants that are talking about where they source their food, uh, sourcing them carefully. And there are other places where this is, has started to become part of the culture. Look at the Portlands, but both Oregon and Maine, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, we're seeing more and more people care about this. I have a theory that it's correlated with tattoos. But uh, <laughs> so. We could solve this problem either by running out and getting tattoos or by talking about it. And, and that's what we're going to do here today. I'm going to introduce Kathy and Chris. But before I do that, I want just to get a little bit of a sense of who's here. How many are Austin locals? Anybody? A few. Do we have any food professionals? Grow it, write about it, cook it. Nice. Any actual farmers? Farmers. I'm going to have to hold down the fort on the farmer. I'm on, I farm oysters. And, uh, and I'm always glad to see people who grow food participating in these discussions. And as we continue to have them, I think it's an important thing to, to look for. But I think what we're here to talk about is transparency. But we all think about transparency in the context of genetically modified foods. And I just heard that in Texas, there's a bill just got floated yesterday to label genetically modified foods. And I don't want to oversimplify it. Most people aren't either all for them, all against them. But if we divided people into roughly for them, roughly against them, or undecided, how many of you are roughly for them? How many people are roughly against them? And how many people are undecided? So we actually have some of each. And we're going to come back to that at the end. There are a number of issues I want to get through. And then once we get to do that, I, I want to open it up. So if you've got questions, we hopefully uh, have answers. And we certainly want to talk about those things. But first, let me tell you who we're talking to here. Kathy Enright is a scientist first. She, uh, she has a PhD in biochemistry. And after school, it was all agriculture all the time. She was with the federal government, um, worked as an agricultural trade and environment negotiator. And then from there, she worked in the produce industry. She has worked with organic farmers and conventional. Um, and uh, now she is, since 2011, she's executive director of the Council for Biotechnology Information and executive vice president for food and ag at the Biotechnology Industry Organization. Uh, she's also served on President Obama's Agriculture Policy Committee in 2008 and again in 2012. Please welcome Kathy Enright. Chris Miller has a job I think we can all envy. He works for Ben and Jerry's. And not just working for an ice cream maker. Uh, he is the social mission activism manager at Ben and Jerry's. And I don't think any other company has that particular title on its roster. Uh, he is responsible for development and execution of the company's issue advocacy campaigns, um, which I think if you follow Ben and Jerry's, you know that those are all rooted in the company's progressive values and tradition. Um, before Ben & Jerry's, he led sustainability work at Seventh Generation. You're probably all familiar with the, the household products company. Um, and in the nonprofit world, he directed Greenpeace USA's national climate campaign and served on the staff of Congressman Bernie Sanders. Please welcome Chris Miller. Let's leave aside genetically modified food just for a moment. And let's talk about transparency. Because we have two people here who represent different sides of the food spectrum. Um, but common ground, I think, is going to be the essential first step to a constructive discussion. So the first question, Kathy, I'm going to start with you. What is transparency, and why is it important? Thanks, Tamar, and good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. My, my thinking is that uh, transparency is more important ever now. Uh, 
more than, more than ever now, I should say, because while I've worked for, uh, as Tamar said, organic industry and the conventional ag industry, and now I work for companies who develop seeds, including GMO seeds, which are used uh, in conventional farming, we are seemingly uh, pitted against one another, right? And we have common objectives. I've never met a farmer, quite frankly, I don't know about a company who's invested in farming that isn't uh, committed to the production of an abundant, safe, nutritious food in the most ecologically balanced way possible while providing for economic viability for the farmers. So no matter where you are, what side, what side of the farming production spectrum you are, that's a common goal. But you wouldn't know it if you looked in the digital space. So I think that uh, it's time for us to have an open, honest conversation, transparency, which means um, not talking to each other all the time talking you know, across, across the field, one might say. That's why we're really excited that Chris is here today, because we're going to need every tool in the toolbox uh, to, to meet our objectives uh, with the challenges we're facing today. We've got a burgeoning world population, uh, and we've got impacts of climate change. So if we're going to produce that abundance, safe, nutrition, uh, tr nutritionally balanced food, if we're going to take care of the environment, and still provide for our farmers, we need to be talking with people about how our food is grown so that there is more understanding and knowledge, more participation in the conversation so we can get, we can keep those tools in the toolboxes, we can have our policymakers understand better where we're coming from. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. So balancing the interests of consumers, the need to feed a large population, and farmers using every responsible tool in the toolbox. Absolutely. Chris. You know, I think transparency is incredibly important. I think, uh, you know, at Ben & Jerry's, we've, we've been uh, really proud of the ingredients that we use to make our products. We, uh, you know, and I think increasingly, to your point, whether it's Austin or even Vermont or, you know, many places, uh, this sort of trend towards transparency. Consumers want to know, you know, where their food comes from, how it was grown. In many cases, they want to know the farmer that produced it. Uh, and I think it's a fad that's not going away. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so, you know, I really do believe companies should be proud of the ingredients they use. We, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about what we put in a pint. You know, we source our, our our dairy from small family farms about 20 miles north of our corporate headquarters and have done since the beginning of the company. We, we source fair trade certified uh, you know, sugar, cocoa, bananas. We're really proud to talk about the producers that produce that, uh, those ingredients. We, we buy brownies from a, a bakery in Yonkers that has an open hiring policy that uh, called the Grayston Bakery. So, you know, I think I think companies ought to be really proud to stand up and tell you what they're putting in their stuff. And I think it's it's a problem for companies, or, or uh, you know, when when they are not willing to do that. And so you're operating under the principle that some producers are better than others. I think sure. I mean, I mm -hmm. think uh, you know whether you're looking at labor practices or you're looking at environmental mm -hmm. sustainability. Yeah, I mean, some people do it better than others. And so, Kathy, to your point, that no farmer that you've ever met um, isn't concerned about ecological practices and producing things responsibly. If every farmer is producing responsibly, why do we need transparency? Well, I think it's. Uh it, if that message were clear, mm -hmm. we'd be a little further along in our conversation about transparency uh, than we are today. Uh, you'll see things um, written about conventional farmers, for example, dousing crops or pesticides being sprayed with abandon. Mm -hmm. That's just not true. No farmer does that. At, the very, at, the, very, at the very least, that's costly to farmers. And why would we do that, right? It's like filling your gas tank 
as, as much as you need and then letting the gasoline run out, we wouldn't waste money, farmers won't waste money. They care about their bottom line, mm -hmm. they care about the environment. But I think um, the conversation tomorrow has become um, good versus evil, bad sure. versus, instead of different, different benefits, mm -hmm. perhaps different vulnerabilities, whether you're an organic farmer or a conventional mm -hmm. farmer, you provide benefits, but you also have vulnerabilities. Sure. And I think that that knowledge helps remove some of the rhetoric in this conversation. And I think different is good, diversity is good, but, but please know that I think at the end of the day, we're all moving in the same direction. It just looks differently, say from one of my companies versus Chris's company, Ben & Jerry's. Okay, I'm gonna push back just a little bit on that because I think we can all agree that a, a public discourse where people are lobbing grenades over the trenches and calling each other names is not very constructive. But if we're not gonna have it that way, I think we have to offer an alternative vision of Absolutely. what this discourse has to be. Agreed. And I guess, you know, there is, there is a perception in this country, and I agree that sometimes it is stated in a way that is wildly overdone, but there is a perception that industrialized farming has done damage to the environment. And I think that there's data to back that up in some instances. And so transparency isn't useful unless we go forward with this idea that some farming is better than others. Which practices would you have consumers look at if they don't look at genetic modification? What practices would you like to see consumers be able to make choices about? I think that if we, uh, I think that's, I think I love your question because it's practices that consumers can make choices about, right? Do, do we know in America what practices organic farmers use, for example? Organic farmers, just like conventional farmers, apply fertilizer, they apply pesticides, they use water, they use energy, fossil fuel, electricity. All of us are, have a footprint. It doesn't matter whether you're small or large or you're conventional agriculture, uh, you're conventional or organic. Just having that information out, so it gives folks maybe a, a wider view of what farming is. And then as I talked about, there are benefits and there are vulnerabilities. In conventional agriculture, yield has been a huge benefit. In organic uh, agriculture, in my mind, the, the adoption of practices that um, maintain healthier soils, for example, um, has been a benefit. So you're looking for a more granular way to look at this beyond just labels organic and conventional, something that looks more specifically. Chris, you mentioned a few things that are on your transparency list. What else? Well, let me just say, I think, I think there's sort of two issues here that are kind of on the table, right? First, there is this issue of transparency in food and, and yeah. whether consumers have a right to know what's in the products that they're buying, GMOs, how things are grown, country of origin, all of these things. And then there's a conversation around genetically engineered ingredients, right? Are they good, bad, sustainable, not sustainable? There's a debate there. But, but to be clear, these, while these things are sort of connected, uh, they are also separate. They're, we don't have to believe that GMOs are unhealthy to require a label, right? To, to require sure. disclosure. In fact, in, in the US, we don't label dangerous things. We don't sell them, uh, it, specifically food anyway. Uh, cigarettes aside. Uh, so, so I think there are these two different pieces. I, look, I think transparency is coming. Mm -hmm. Technology, mobile technology, apps that allow shoppers to know everything about a product uh, at the point of purchase. Uh, uh, companies are either going to embrace this sort of sense of transparency, whether it's around GMO sweeteners, you know, manufacturing process, uh, et cetera, or they will be sort of dragged into it. That's so, a very good point, and I want to get to that right. a little bit later. But first, I do want to talk about some of the basics of genetically modified foods, yeah. because I think we can all agree that whether it's warranted or whether it's not, 
GMOs have become the touchstone of this debate about industrialized agriculture. And as such, I think we have to address them specifically. And one of the things that I think is frustrating to people who see benefits in genetically modified foods is that if you look at the people who are studying how people think about these things, you find that most people don't really care. And when you ask the question, would you like to have genetically modified foods labeled, 93% of the people say yes. But if you ask people, what are genetically modified foods? Do you think you're eating genetically modified foods? And Bill Hallman, who's a social scientist at Rutgers, did a, a, an in-depth study. And when you ask people, what would you like to see on a label? Only 7% say genetically modified foods. And a, a social scientist of the first rank, Jimmy Kimmel, did uh, those, anybody seen those videos? Yeah, yeah, where he goes saying. out and he says, okay, well, what's a genetically modified <laughs> food? And nobody can answer. But they all have this idea that it's bad for them. And so we have this situation where people don't really understand what genetic modification is, but they've gotten this idea that it's bad for them. Is that a good foundation for transparency? Look, this, I, I believe that, that the way in which consumers think about this is driven primarily by the industry that's opposed transparency. That the reason people are concerned about it is because they have this sense that there are a bunch of corporations that don't want to tell them that these things are in the food they're eating. Mm -hmm. I think it's a problem that has largely been caused by the perception that these companies are spending, you know, more than $100 million in four states opposing transparency. And so I think that makes consumers say, well, what are they trying to, why don't they want to tell I'm sure you want to respond to that. I will, thank you. And that, I, I would say that explaining that um, uh, seeming disconnect is, is a challenge for us. Uh, my companies support a right to know, I agree with Chris, the provision of information is inevitable, right? In the United States, uh, perhaps in developed countries, at least in the near term, because we're in the 21st century. If consumers have questions about how their food is grown, they deserve answers. So then the question is from Chris, is so why are you fighting uh, GMO labeling? Because we believe that the GMO labels that have been proposed are skull and crossbones. They're not really meant to inform, because of course, as Tamar said, most people don't even know what a GMO is. It sounds dangerous, genetically modified organism. But to slap that in prominent letters, look at the, you know, the uh, language of the bills, um, on the front of packages, right, or in bins, conveys to consumers something about our technology that we know is not true. Okay, let's ask that question directly then. And the question is, if GMOs were labeled, what would you expect consumers to do? Kathy and then Chris. If they're labeled the way the labeling bills are written across the country, they're all the same, written by the same folks. If they are labeled in that way, our understanding is that it will scare people from purchasing them. And so will the food companies take that chance? They won't. What they'll do is deselect them, not use them. Go to non-GM, it'll still be conventional, but go to non-GM. That is everything that we oppose about moving agriculture to constant improvement. We don't want to go back to a time when genetic, genetically engineered seeds, G GMO seeds now in the common vernacular, weren't available, and we were using more toxic pesticides and using them more often. That's, we, that's a direction so we don't want to move. Your, so it's a your principle. Your expectation is that consumers would uh, be inclined to reject these things mm -hmm. to the extent that we would roll back genetically modified foods in the food supply. Chris, is that also your expectation? You know, I'm not sure how consumers will would react to labeled food. My instinct is to think it wouldn't, you know, have a profound impact on, you know, your average shopper. Uh, you know, 82% of households buy organic. People sort of dabble in conventional, they dabble in organic. But, but let me be clear, this, is, this, this really isn't a warning label. It's not skull and crossbones. It's on the back of pack 
not front of pack. It's relatively small letters that would be a, a similar font size to the ingredient listing on the pack. And, and food companies like ours have to disclose a whole bunch of things, whether sweeteners are natural or artificial. Not because artificial sweeteners are unhealthy, but because they're different, right? We, we have to label farm-raised salmon in this country, not because it's unhealthy or less nutritious than wild salmon, mm -hmm. but because it helps consumers make decisions. We have to label concentrated orange juice in this country, not because it's unsafe or it's a warning label, but because it's different and it provides consumers with the information they want. So, you know, I think, I think this is not a warning label. I think, you know, and the truth is, you know, Kathy and I were talking about this earlier, if you look at an ingredient deck of, you know, a snack chip, I won't use a brand, but, you know, the ingredient deck, there are things on there that none of us can pronounce or have any idea what it is, and people eat lots of nacho cheese snack chips. So, Kathy, how about that? And one of the problems in parsing this issue is that people who oppose labeling tend to predict that it's going to be catastrophic, and people who support labeling tend to predict that nothing's going to happen. And one of the tropes out there is that there's a hidden agenda among labelers because they do want to get uh, uh, genetic modification out of the food supply. Um, but it's sort of hard to address that directly when nobody says that that's true. Although, you know, some people have. Why are you so convinced that consumers will reject it um, when it's easy to know that something like 80% of the foods in our food supply, the process, the, the center of the aisle, have genetically modified ingredients and there don't seem to have been any rejection of it so far? Well, I don't think they know, right? I mean, that's, that's the issue. Um, again, we're not, my companies are not food companies. At the end of the day, just as, as um, food manu just as Ben and Jerry's is choosing, food manufacturers are going to choose what to, how to source. You know, they're going to choose a, um, a system that they want to support, mm -hmm. and they're going to put on their label uh, what they want to put on, on their label. I can tell you that as I, I uh, talk about this issue around the country, GMO labeling can be top of mind, right? But then folks will say, but we also want to know about pesticides, what kind of pesticide. We want to know about the carbon footprint. We not want to know about the food miles. We want to know about sustainability goals of the farmers and right. the processors. and coming. So Let are we going up. to, so, so rather than pick one issue, it happens to be my issue, rather than pick one issue, GMO, why are we not sitting down, working together to provide that information that, as I said, I think it's deserved and I think it's inevitable, but it has to be in a way that um, makes sense for food manufacturers. Okay. Let's talk about that. And for consumers. Because it's important. And so the issue here is that there are a bazillion things that bazillion. people want to know about right. farmers. And people want to be able to bazillion. vote with their feet for practices they support, and that way there is pressure on farmers to do things that people want to eat and want to see outgrowing in the world. How many of you guys know about my GMO yeast, the one that produces the omega-3 fats? One. One guy, he reads my column. <laughs> <laughs> He's the only one. Great. Um, that, that GMO, omega-3 fats, long chain omega-3 fats are critical for human development, and they're found almost exclusively in marine sources, in fish and in algae. Um, there's trace amounts in grass-fed beef and milk, but very, very small. And we have two choices to feed people this essential fat for neurodevelopment. One of them is to get forage fish to feed to other fish and to make uh, capsules for this, these omega-3 fats. And the other way is to farm algae, which is very expensive and time consuming because you have to farm a lot of algae to get a little bit of omega-3 fats. Now scientists at DuPont have taken an algae gene and they've put it in a yeast that naturally produces an oil, so that yeast produces EPA, which is one of the long chain omega-3 fats. They do it in a lab. It produces a lot of EPA. The EPA is chemically indistinguishable from the stuff that comes from the algae. So here we have the solution to a pressing problem that could, uh, that could help save our fisheries. Now, the question is, 
with genetic modification is, ta I'll get to the question, I will, I promise. <laughs> that, that, that genetic modification is this technique that can do all these crazy things. Can you imagine, Chris, a GMO that you can support? This is not about supporting GMO. GMO is a technology. It's right. inherently neither good nor bad. So can I take right? that as a so, yes? So, but let me be clear. 99% of all genetically engineered crop area in the world is pesticide and herbicide resistant right. corn, soy, and cotton. So could that save the world? Heck yes. Could there be a GMO technology that solves the problem of, of growing crops in drought regions or feeds the world or does something wonderful? Absolutely. But, but let's, be, let's have a conversation about what, what GMOs are that's today. A, that's a great, great point, and I'm going to get back to that. But Kathy, I have a similar question for you. Chris's point about herbicide resistance and BT crops is well taken. Roundup resistant soy is hard to love. We know that. Roundup ready soy is, is hard to love. And consumers have rebelled against it across the spectrum. Can you imagine a genetically modified crop that you don't support? Not at the moment. Not, Not the one moment. that's okay, in the well. development. But I, but I, but I have to take exception at your, but, but Tamar, I think that um, what folks don't understand about herbicide tolerance is that it is enabling farmers who adopt Roundup Ready seed mm -hmm. or, or uh, glyphosate uh, tolerant seed, it allows the farmer adopters to move to more sustainable agricultural practices. They're going to no-till or low-till agriculture. What does that mean to consumers? What that means is topsoil is being conserved. Again, what does that mean? That means that farm runoff is reduced. And we it can, means we can but, argue but, about but let that. Me just, but so, so I think that I just, I'll get to the vulnerability okay, part. Right? Good. I talked about benefits and vulnerabilities. So we've got that sustainability. We've got farmers spending less time on their tractors to apply herbicides. Mm -hmm. That's a reduction in CO2 emissions into the air, right? You can, the, the data is there. So the vulnerability, right, the vulnerability mm -hmm. is, so not surprisingly, now we have the development of weeds resistant to glyphosate I'm because we to ran that. to that. I'm going to so ask we you have to step to, back but, from But that. I think we have to look at, I, I, would, I would argue that with each of these practices, technologies, methods, you don't throw the baby, the good baby, out Absolutely. with the bathwater. And you, that is a You point. embrace the benefits, but then you work drawing from knowledge, you know, that, that, that many farming systems have sure. to work on those vulnerabilities. But can you imagine that because not all genetically modified organisms are the same, mm -hmm. and we should be evaluating them on a case-by-case -case basis, sure. and that's one of the objections to the label. If it says genetically modified what foods it on mean? it, you don't know if it's my yeast and Correct. it's my yeast. Or, or if it's something else that you don't support. Mm -hmm. So, That's right. here's the next question. If these are so different, and if there are some that you can support, and if, if Kathy, you believe that there are different benefits and different vulnerabilities for each one, don't we want to give consumers not just the fact that this is genetically modified, but how it's genetically exactly. modified? Exactly. You, you Would made you my point. Would you prefer to give consumers Look, all I, the information? Absolutely. The more information, the better. This, this is, you know, I, I think I didn't write the language in the bills, but there, there, is some, there has been some discussion around do you just label back of pack may contain genetically engineered ingredients, or do you actually, in the ingredient deck, specify which ingredient has been genetically so, modified. But how, how, about, but how? how about we take a leaf from Ag Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack's book. And he has suggested, and he's not the first person to suggest, that perhaps rather than putting it on the label on the box, that we have QR codes. And you can put your phone on the, on the, on the QR code. You can find out whether it's genetically modified. You can find out how it's genetically modified. And because there's a bazillion other things, farm worker wages, pesticide application, maybe you want to know the date something was picked, um, we would have 
the capability to put all of those things in that one place because it doesn't have to fit on the box. And it might get around the question of scaring people who may not know what genetically modified foods are because it's the people who care who are going to bother. Kathy, how, could that work for you? So I think that that is a choice, right? Yes, I think that certainly is what um, many uh, food companies in America are now thinking about uh, doing, right? How do we do this in a way that provides, um, that provides honest, open information? But you also wouldn't want to make that be the only way. I mean, Ben & Jerry's has every right to, instead of putting that information out there somewhere in the digital space, to put it on their label. I mean, it, I think the, the provision of the information is necessary, and I think companies will determine how best to do it. I agree with Chris that um, in the United States, increasingly Americans are asking questions about how their food is grown. Smart companies are going to answer those questions. How do you feel about QR codes? I mean, come on, we're at South by Southwest Interactive. Does anyone use QR codes? Really? I, I, something like two or three percent of consumers use them. The truth is there are already a number of apps that do exactly what you've suggested. Mm -hmm. I think that this turns on, do we believe that consumers have a right to know? If we believe they do, then, you, then it has to be mandatory labeling. Or do we believe that companies have a right to decide what you want to know. And if that's true, then we can have a voluntary QR code kind of but system. But what if it's not a voluntary QR system? What if it's a mandatory QR system? Look, shoppers make decisions at the point of purchase. They read the labels. You know, a lot of people won't care about GMOs. I, I you know, I don't care about the vitamin B content of my breakfast cereal, but there's some people that do. There's some people that care about fat, and there's some people that care about sodium. You know, shoppers look for different things, but they, they look at the label as the place to get information. So, I mean, it seems, it seems unlikely that we're going to be working our way through the supermarket scanning QR codes on everything we buy. Yet we're having this vociferous discussion about a right to know, but you're arguing that the right to know isn't so burning that somebody will put their phone up to a QR code. I think some people do that with Good Guide or other apps. I think certain products people are very concerned about. You know, I worked at Seven Generation. I, I don't like to buy sort of conventional cleaning products, but, uh, you know, I use head and shoulders shampoo, you know? I mean, I don't use a natural shampoo. I, you know, so some things people You're care fired. about. Some people, you know? <laughs> Oh, wait, it's not a Unilever product. <laughs> so, okay, well then let's step back again. We started by talking about transparency. We got pretty deep into GMOs. Kathy, what would you like to see on labels, if not GMOs? If you want the industry to strike a blow for trust among consumers, where would you start? I'd start with this conversation. I'd start with bringing together proponents and um, folks of labeling and those that oppose mm -hmm. and figure out a way that works for everyone. I don't know how this labeling issue on GMOs is going to turn out, right? It could be, at the end it could be voluntary, it could be on the package, it could be an app, it could be mandatory, mm -hmm. it could be on the package, it could be on the app, but we'll have done a disservice to American consumers if they see a GMO label and they have no idea what it means. If we're talking about the trait that a GMO food may have, that's a different conversation. If we're talking about a way to provide the information that doesn't scare consumers, this is about a technology we support and believe in, right? But remember, I've worked for organic farmers, I've worked for conventional, sure. the non-GMO um, uh, farmers. Let's get the information out there. And again, I'm not gonna to guess how it's gonna come out on the voluntary mandatory. It'll be solved in some way. But the information has to be meaningful and it has to be honest. Or you know what? 
we're just going to have this same conversation in 10 years. You told me this was GMO, but you didn't tell me that the, or, the organic um, um, counterpart, right, was using heavy metals. You didn't tell me that. I don't think there's a winner for any of us if we don't have the accurate information out there. We so you would support a trait-based system? So it's not oh, genetically modified food? Yeah. Organism, I'd, su I'd a support a GMO system with the trait. That'd be fantastic. On but the label? It depends if it's mandatory or okay. voluntary. Just to be clear, we have voluntary GMO right. labeling now. Any company that uses genetically engineered ingredients can put on the package that they're using genetically engineered ingredients. Do you know how many companies mm -hmm. that use GMO ingredients put that on pack in the current voluntary system? Zero. Uh, you know, I mean, this is a really interesting sort of, I represent the kind of food side and Kathy represents the biotechnology, the, the, you know, the, the technology companies that create these things. And it's interesting because for food companies, they're sort of caught in the middle, right? Because on the one hand, you've got kind of consumers over here <laughs> saying, we want to know what it is. And I get that not everyone really understands what it is. You've got food companies that are, are using genetically engineered ingredients, but there's no functional benefit to the company, right? You know, we transitioned out of GMO ingredients. Uh, we finished the transition uh, at the end of last year. Before that, you know, we would use uh, a little bit of soy lecithin in a fudge chip, and you know, mm -hmm. 90 some odd percent of soy is genetically engineered, so certainly that soy lecithin came from genetically engineered soy. But we didn't spec it. We didn't say mm -hmm. to, the, to the cocoa manufacturer, please give us a, so a, a cocoa chip with GE soy lecithin. Mm -hmm. So there's no functional benefit to the company. It's not more nutritious. It's not cheaper. Mm -hmm. Yet this, this change has happened, right? Over the mm -hmm. last 20 some odd years, we went from no G GE crops to 90 some odd percent of everything. Mm -hmm. And so these, so you're seeing companies like Hershey's and Cheerios, right, making these announcements, leaders like Whole Foods that are pushing towards labeling. I mean, it, it, it is interesting that these brands and companies find themselves sort of the focus of consumer ire, and there's really no functional benefit to them. But I, I would argue with that because I believe that many of the companies um, who are transitioning from GM to non-GM, it's their choice. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they want uh, as big a piece of the pie as mm -hmm. they can get, right? So they're going to meet the needs of a certain uh, set of their consumers. I'm all for that. That's called competition. It's in the marketplace, mm -hmm. and here we are, right, in the United States. But the fact is, is one of the biggest questions they struggle with in the, um, in the boardroom or in the, you know, the, the C-suite mm -hmm. office, when we move to a non-GM, source, having used solely a GM source, what is that going to do to our sustainability goals? That is a question that they're struggling with because they are, they, this is, I don't even think consumers realize this. There is a, a culture of, there's a sustainability race within food manufacturers, right? I don't even know that it's that obvious to consumers when you're buying a product off the shelf, but if you look at the large food manufacturers, they're all um, committed to moving in the direction of more and more, sis more and more sustainability. And to some, that means reduced environmental footprint, for example. So that is a big question they have to ask themselves, and, and I'm not there for the answer mm -hmm. uh, to that question, but it does impact their sustainability goals, the ones that they have said and are working toward re reduced inputs, and smaller how, footprint. So Chris, how about the idea that genetically modified crops play an important role in sustainability in this country and by pushing to get them out of the supply chain, um, we could have some consequences that are unsustainable. I guess I don't want to kind of debate the science around sustainability yeah. here. What I can tell you is that we believe at Ben and Jerry's that small scale family farming, small holder cooperatives is a better, more sustainable form of agriculture than big, you know, agribusiness. I, so that's how we source. That's, 
you know, our strategy. We support small-scale family dairy farmers. We support small-scale cooperatives in the global south that grow ingredients. We buy cherries from a, a cooperative in Oregon. We believe that it is a better, more sustainable way to farm. I've written about a lot of these issues in ways that require me to go so deep that people will not talk to me at parties anymore. <laughs> and I know the feeling. The, <laughs> the answer when you start looking at these issues, big versus small, conventional versus organic, grass-fed versus conventional, um, the answer never is one side is right and one side is wrong. It is always that there are some practices from one side and some practices from the other side that, that could make a best practices list. So in saying that small is better, um, I, and you didn't mention organic specifically, I don't think, but that organic is better. Um, we're a conventional company, right? We're, right. we're not organic. I know. Um, by, by defining better in this way, are you throwing the baby out with the bathwater, as Kathy said? Because there are some practices that large farmers engage in. You do get economies of scale for mechanization that helps produce food more efficiently at large scale. Uh, perhaps we do. 70% of the world's food is grown by smallholder farmers. So this idea that, that sort of big agribusiness is feeding the world, I don't think is accurate. And the truth is, you know, 90% of the corn that's grown in the U.S., well, 45% of the corn that's grown in the U.S., GE corn, is for biofuels, 45% goes to animal feed, a little bit gets exported, and the rest gets turned into high fructose corn syrup. So suggesting that, you know, are farms important to the American economy? Yes. To the Midwest, yes. But are those farms sort of feeding the, you know, feeding the world? But wait. So this idea that there are good things and bad things about every kind of, of agriculture. Sure. Um, and you, you default to the bad things. How about the good things? How about, and you know, the 70% yeah. from small farms is not true in the United States. It's, it's true in other parts of the world. Globally, that's a global thing. That's yes. a global thing. And we Correct. can talk about that, but it's a different issue. Yeah, yeah. And in the United States, that's not true at all. And how about the economies of scale? How about the idea that judicious use of herbicide resistance can, can increase no-till and reduce erosion? How about the idea that BT corn reduces the spraying of pesticides, which it absolutely factually does? How about those pluses? I, again, technology is inherently neither good nor bad. Sure. I, I'm not here to suggest that that, you know, that's true. Again, I don't want to debate the science on this, but there are a lot of folks who would, and, and there is a fair bit of data that shows that the most sustainable way to farm is crop rotation, cover cropping. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not big sort of monocropping, uh, you know, leaving fields bare for, you know, half the year, that, that what you're finding is that that, you know, that impacts yield. So yes, might there be some good things? A absolutely. And okay, I'll take that as, yeah. a, as a grudging acknowledgement go. of pluses. And 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 I'm sure Kathy, you can you can. Uh, well, I, I just think we have to remember, thanks to Mar and Chris, is that you know, 98 percent of farms in um, uh, farm operations in America are run by family farmers, right? Big and small. Just like any other industry, business that we have. We have small businesses and we have large businesses in this country. That didn't start with GMOs. That's been our history for about 80 years, mm -hmm. right? It was, it's interesting that, that the organic movement, it, it was kind of an epiphany, if you will, right? As, as we moved in this direction of, of economies of scale, efficiencies, the use of synthetic pesticides, et cetera. And then 40, 50 years ago, some folks thought, you know what, I have a different idea. Um, I, I think that we need to help folks in the United States understand how their food is grown, give them the information, 
accurately, honestly, and then let them decide for themselves. And if that means at the end of the day that we move towards a, a farming system that Chris is describing, we've done so. But you know what? My companies will do that also, right? My big companies, they, are, they, provide, they produce seeds now. They produce organic, conventional, and GMO seeds, mm -hmm. right? They're going to listen to what their farmers are asking them for, right? That will happen. The marketplace will take care of that. But I think, again, we've, we will have then lost this um, opportunity to talk with Americans about how our food is grown. What do you want to see, right? What don't you want to see, <laughs> good and bad, across the world? Chris is absolutely right. 95% of the world's farmers are small, are small shareholders, right? But in the United States, we have abundant food, clearly. We have abundant food. And in the Midwest, farms tend to be larger than, say, they might be along the coast. So let's just say that tomorrow we flip a switch and those Midwest farms, conventional and, you know, plus or minus GM, if they're using GM, um, and we said, that's it, we're done with uh, weeds, weed killers, herbicides, we're done. We're not, in this country, we're not laying herbicide down anymore, right? Because organic farm doesn't use weed killers, right? It's all um, mechanical or by hand. 70 million Americans are now going to have to pull weeds in the Midwest. Sure, and, but again, we, we this, can't, this we stark have to be contrast is, is, it's easy to, to, to talk about. But the reality is always more nuanced it's than that. It's always more nuanced. And, and I guess that's why we're having this discussion. We've got about 15 minutes left, and I do want to open it up. I've got more questions. I can do this till the cows come home. <laughs> but I'm hoping that some of you are interested in this topic and have some questions. Yeah, in the back. Chris. Chris. What concerns you? What exactly is your question? So the idea that a consistent crop feeds our livestock stream consistently, and that's a benefit all the way through the food chain. Right. And that's just kind of easy to do. I guess, I don't know, I'm just kind of confused. You're right. I think that that's really important. And I'm going to just step in here and, and follow up on one of your points. And one of the issues, one of the arguments about GMOs, and perhaps you've seen it, is this argument about yield, where some people say GMOs have increased yield, and some people say, no, they haven't, and everybody has a different set of data. But my understanding, and I've, again, I've spent some time with this, is that, um, that it is consistency that, that counts. So the, the farmer has a better shot at a consistent yield year after year. And as a farmer, I can certainly appreciate that as an advantage. So how about that, this idea that a consistent yield helps feed a food chain consistently with fewer ups and downs? Again, I'm not a scientist and I'm, I'm not a journalist. I'm an ice cream guy. But, but I, I mean, there was a story uh, in the New York Times. <laughs> Gosh, now I sound like the climate people who say, I'm not a scientist, but. I know, you sound like a Republican. Uh, oh, person. my goodness. Uh, but, no, but, but there was, a, there was a brilliant story in the New York Times a, w a week or so ago about a, a, a rancher in the Midwest that's doing, right. you know, that's doing crop rotation, cover cropping, sure. talking about how that's protected, how his yields in drought years were significantly higher than the farmers around him who I were. So, so it's not clear to me that, that that's actually the case, that this, you know, GE monocropping is, 
is doing all these things. So, I mean, there's a, there's, to your point, there's, there's data on both sides, but I think, you know, 40, 45% of, of corn us. grown is grown for animal feed. I mean, yes, almost half right of the corn grown is used to feed mm -hmm. animals. But, but may I add, but, but it's important that you all know that. And on the monocropping, monocropping has nothing to do with genetic modification. It has to do with history in this country. It has to do with um, the economics for the farmer. And it has to do with, you know, ensuring a, 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 a viable, uh, consistent crop. So you hear about corn and beans being rotated, but we have monocropping in wine growing regions. We have monocropping in the Pacific Northwest with wheat. Neither of those are GMO. We have monocropping in the north central part of the country in Pacific Northwest on barley. Those aren't GMO. We're, we're adding GMO into a conversation that really, you know, as if GMO is to blame, it's not to blame. Okay, but wait a second. But, I'm going to push back on that, Kathy, for a second because I think, let's go back, anybody read Dan Charles' excellent book, Lords of the Harvest, about the, sort of the inception of, of, of biotechnology? And there was a deliberate decision to focus on crops that cover the most acreage, which is corn sure. and soy, because that's how you recoup your money. If, yeah. if you know, there's only a few acres of green beans, you don't spend millions of dollars improving green beans because you can't get your money back. And so the first biotech really was a doubling down on industrial yeah. agriculture because that's, the, that's what yeah. drives the profits. And so to say that these things don't play any role in... I, I didn't say there. I'm, I'm saying that farmers make decisions for many reasons, but including economics, right? Absolutely. So wheat doesn't have GM, right? It was really rejected by the wheat farmers about 10 or 12 years ago. And guess what happened? Wheat farmers moved out of wheat where they weren't making any money, into corn and beans where they could make money. So I guess you could, one might want to blame GM, but it was economics that, that, that truly drove. No, and, that's a, and again, each one of these points is one we could spend yeah. 20 minutes but if, on. But so I if I could just talk about the animal yeah, feed, absolutely. again, I think it's important. I mean, now is we have this opportunity during this, this free for all, good versus evil, big versus small, this is bad, you know, this is, this is um, beneficial, to actually talk straight to Americans, right? So, yes, we feed our crop, our livestock, GM corn and soybean. But you know what? They also do that in Europe. But do you think the Europeans talk about that out loud? Europe is a, not, is a, um, one of many countries, right, that requires labeling of GM on products in the supermarket. But what has happened over the last 20 years is that farmers in Europe haven't been able to keep up with the productivity for feed because most of our grain goes for feed or energy in the United States. They haven't been able to keep up. Mm -hmm. But food made from animals fed with GM feed don't need to be labeled in Europe. So where does Europe get it's 75% of its animal feed. From the US, Brazil, and Argentina, that's all biotech. That's what I'm talking about. Let's just put the information out there, and then I just think we'll have better policies, we'll have better informed leaders, and we'll stop, hopefully, this um, he, he said, said, she said, said that's exactly what on I was agriculture, say. because it's not black or white. Okay, it's I never do, black or white. I do white. want to move to another question. This gentleman here. That's exactly the question I have. I've seen this. You know, this is an awesome panel. You're doing a wonderful job of moderating. She is, isn't she? she but really there's is. always a but when somebody says but. that. Sure. <laughs> Honestly, it's but always you can't write to save it's your always life. he said, she said. Mm -hmm. You know, I've sat in this this past year because I work in this industry several times, as I know other people have. But and it's always like my side, my side. The truth is, conventional farmers use some things that'll kill you. The other truth is. Organic farmers use things on their crops that'll also kill you. That's right. How can we get accurate information, not the spin of information, but you know, accurate information? Here's what goes on strawberries. Organic, here's what goes on strawberries, conventional. People would be shocked if they knew the truth of that. That's, you know, so tell me, how can we not have he said, she said? 
and get information out to people so they could make decisions. Because right, the problem is they can't column. make decisions because it's always <laughs> skewed one way or another. Read Tamar's column. Read my column. Even Chris says, read my column. But uh, I'm going to just jump in here because this is a question for journalists. And, that, and there are some fine, fine journalists out there. Nathaniel Johnson, Ed Grist, Keith Kluwer, who are doing a really good job trying to parse these things. And as somebody who answers that question for a living, I can attest to how difficult it is. But I'm sure you guys have comments on this also. You know, I think there are a set of facts in the world. People have looked at this stuff. There are things we know about this, uh, this particular technology and things we don't know. But I think what you do and the promise of technology uh, is, is you just, you're transparent about everything. You know, the Environmental Working Group has done a fabulous job on products in, in the personal care area, right? So companies have to disclose the ingredients they do, they use, and then Environmental Working Group has built an incredible database that look at what are the issues with particular ingredients. Because if you look at an ingredient deck on shampoo, you have no idea what it is. They've, they've recently released a, a, a similar database around food. So they tell you what are the issues with strawberries? What are the likely pesticides and herbicides that are used? So I think the answer to the question is put all the information out there and let the people who care about this tell you about it. <laughs> Are we out of time? <laughs> Are we out of time? And there you go. Uh, oh, thank you, thank you. Um, so the issue here that you asked is about the he said she said, and I would make the argument that the uh, the EWG engages in some of that, and EWG has a viewpoint on these things, and so that particular list, like. The Dirty Dozen list, for example, that EWG puts out has a point of view. Kathy, what's your sense on this? So I think that as consumers, if it sounds um, too good to be true or too bad, um, just think about that. What is the, what is the interest of the group that is propo uh, proposing um, a, a, an advocating for a side? You can look among um, our companies We'd never malign organic or conventional non-GMO farming. We have no problem with what Whole Foods is doing. Mm -hmm. They're marketing to their customers. We have no problem with the GMO project verified. Voluntary label, there's a niche for that. My goodness, they're, what a cottage industry. They're brilliant to seize on that. I have no problem with, with Ben & Jerry's. Because when I look at Ben & Jerry's, when I eat Ben & Jerry's ice cream, when I look at their website, sitting here with Chris is just, I didn't meet him until this morning. He's not advocating against a sector of agriculture. He's advocating for the right. way he and his business want to move forward. But I want to go back specifically to the gentleman's so, question, which is if you're somebody yeah, sitting yeah. out in the audience trying to make a good decision about these things, how are you supposed to do that? So I would, well, I'm going to pitch our own website. Go to GMO Answers. There, there are only facts there. There's no spin. It's just the facts. You can ask any question. There are independent experts who will answer the questions. That's one source. There are, mm -hmm. there are many sources. If, if you're at, um, getting information and somebody is pointing fingers at the other, I think you've got to step back. One, as consumers, I think we have to be smart about that if it's, if it is this he said and she said, it's never black or white. Mm -hmm. We also need to have conversations like this morning, tomorrow, right? So we here, here, Ben and & Jerry's and, and my companies are seemingly on the opposite sides of right. agriculture, but we're not. Well, we've we're seen some agreement and some disagreement. And I do want to make sure that we can get in. Uh, are there any more questions in the audience? Gentlemen in the back. Yes. yes. Yeah, I'm happy to. Can you identify these sure. Sure, absolutely. So uh, behind the GMO Answers website, I wear two hats. I think Tamar said that at the mm -hmm. beginning. Um, as the Council of Biotech Information is supported by the large 
um, agriculture seed developers. So that would be BASF, plant science, that's Bayer crop science, that's Dow agroscience, that is DuPont Pioneer, the Monsanto Company, and Syngenta. Again, they make seeds. They make all seeds. Just They're to be for clear, all of agriculture. Kathy is here unabashedly representing the biotechnology Absolutely. industry sector. There's no, there's, you know, no, there's no hidden right. agenda here. Nope. This is this is what she's doing. And right. can I just make one point as it relates to transparency? So, uh, that's right. They make seeds, but these are also chemical companies. Right, so it's not, they're not just making seeds, they're making chemicals as well that, that work with the seeds. And are there other questions in the room before I ask one last gentleman way in the back? So two quick points. I think we didn't make this decision based on marketing. We really did believe that, and, and, and we sort of coupled the transition out of non-GMO ingredients with our transition to full fair trade certification. So it was a pro we were going to go through the process of looking at every ingredient anyway. And so, you know, given our commitment to small scale, you know, family, smaller sort of agriculture, it felt like the right decision. Clearly the fact that this has become an, a, a trend, uh, you know, helped push us in that direction. Here's what I'll say around super premium. We did not raise the price of a pint of ice cream by transitioning to non-GMO ingredients. It did not impact the, the, you know, the cost of ingredients for us in a significant way. I, I can tell you we didn't take a margin hit by, by sort of changing our sourcing. But Chris, if you went Thanks. to non-GMO animal feed, would you make that same, could you make that same statement? Around costs, around costs. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, again, I'm not clear that, that is there a cost difference between organic and conventional? Absolutely, but, but, but could we return to the system we had 20 years ago and produce conventional non-GMO corn and would that carry the kind of premium? I, I'm not well, sure it would. Can I ask the question in the reverse way and then I think we are gonna have to wrap up because we're, we're how about instead of conventional non-GMO, how about organic GMO? Because if it's the organic style practices like crop rotation, cover cropping, no-till, which herbicide resistance can facilitate, what if we had farmers who were engaging in organic style practices with the benefits to the farmers of uh, genetically modified feed? How, how would that look in your universe? So I'm not sure I entirely understand the question. I think, you know, organic strictly precludes the use right. of genetic engineering. Right, and that's why you were positing right? uh, non-organic, non-GMO. I'm positing organic GMO, so the flip side of the coin. Right, but I, I mean, you know, again, we are not an organic company. We are interested in trying to move towards conventional non-GM. We're, we're, you know, we're not a part of the organic industry. You know, we, we think there's an opportunity to, to move in that none. Okay. Is anyone going to actually kick us out at exactly 1030, or can we take a few more questions? Because there was a question over there on the side that I'd like to take. Oh, okay. All right. In that case, I want to wrap up really quickly and hang out with us, because we're not going anywhere. Um, so we've talked about transparency. And obviously there is some common ground. I do believe that everybody's working toward a sustainable food system, but the visions are obviously a little bit different of what sustainable means and how we achieve it. And to talk about how a conversation can, can help this, I think it's true, but it's limited. So what's the next step beyond talking? How can we have you know, these parties stop engaging in the he said, she said, and really work toward transparency. Kathy, any ideas? I honestly think that that's going to um, take some leadership in government and in uh, the food industry that is not quite mature yet, right? I just, uh, what's, how social media and digital, other digital spaces are being used, that's not going to change. Right? We're going to have to be smarter consumers. 
we're going to have to have a national dialogue, I would say, and that's where I think the leadership mm -hmm. comes in so that in a broad range, in a broad scale, folks have a better understanding of how food gets to their table. We don't talk about it, right? We don't talk about it. We talk about vaccination. Oh, when we had a, when we had a, a crisis, right, an outbreak of measles, we had the CDC, we had the president saying, get your kids vaccinated. I'm hoping we're not going to have to have a crisis before folks will be willing to stand up and talk about what agriculture and food needs to this country. And Chris? You know, I'd like to see all of us align around the idea of transparency. Let's just tell people what's in stuff, and then we can have a debate around what people think about a particular application for genetic engineering technology. Some may love it, some may not, some may buy it, some may not. But let's, I'd love it if all of us in, in the food industry, in, in the seed industry, could just align around the idea, let's tell people what's in the stuff we're selling them. And on that kumbaya note, um, I'd like to thank Kathy and Chris. Please join me. Thank you. And we will be staying around. I think we're getting kicked out of here, but I will be you know, around for at least a little bit if you want to stay and talk. Thank you so much.